Eventually, Jonathan regained control and began to think about his situation. He had been in a state of shock and denial since his wife had calmly informed him of her infidelity earlier that night. At first, he had reacted with anger. The pain caused by her admission had been all but unbearable. His immediate reaction had been to get drunk and vent his anger toward her. Now somewhat sober, he began to realize how vulnerable he felt. Not since the death of his father had he felt so lost. He had loved Susan for practically his whole adult life. Sure, they had problems, but he had never considered them to be all that large. Did he still love her? Of course he loved her. He absolutely despised what she had done to their marriage. He also began to realize how easily love so intense could be fanned into hate under the right circumstances. Susan had been betraying their wedding vows for more than a year, while he had been working himself until he was bone-tired for months in order to have the big house in the right neighborhood that Susan had so wanted, she had been carrying on with a younger man. A man she said she loved and would continue to keep seeing no matter what. Yes, I love her, thought Jonathan. But I can no longer live with her. She had put him in a position that no real man could agree to. He no longer knew who she was. He had come home to what he would have proudly proclaimed as the best wife in the world only a few hours ago, to find she had been cheating and lying to him for over a year. On top of that, she had chastised him for not understanding, and calmly informed him she was holding all the cards. She had looked him right in the eye, and with a mocking smile told him if he sought a divorce, he would end up impoverished and without his children. He could not fathom who this selfish, indulgent person was and what had become of his wife. Finally, unable to stay at the scene of the demise of his happiness any longer, he showered, dressed, got into his truck, and drove off into the night. He drove unlessly until he came to a small diner. Realizing he had not eaten in about sixteen hours, he parked and went inside. The diner was cozy, well-lit, and clean. Shunning the stools at the counter, Jonathan found a booth in the corner and settled in with a forlorn sigh. Deep in thought, he barely remembered ordering an omelet and coffee. Though he should have been starving, he merely picked at his food while consuming cup after cup of strong black coffee. The shock of his wife's confession was no longer a white-hot blaze of rage and turmoil preventing any rational thought. Caffeine and cold anger now spurred his brain into action. He was unsure how long he sat deep in thought, nor how many pots of coffee he had consumed. Eventually, he realized it was light outside, and people were out and going about their business. Jonathan realized he needed a plan. With a renewed sense of purpose, he paid for his meal, used his cell phone to call in sick for the day, and left the diner. He headed for Ben Lawson's office, a friend since childhood, Ben also happened to be a reputable and competent divorce lawyer. Ben, though surprised to see him, smiled genuinely and shook his hand. John, what a surprise. I haven't seen you in months. How's life treating you? Sorry about that, Ben. I've been working my butt off for months now. I wish I could say this is a social visit, but unfortunately, I am going to need your professional services. Ben couldn't help but notice the pained expression on his old friend's face. Damn, John, I can't tell you how sorry I am to hear that. Have a seat and tell me everything. He didn't think he was ready to talk fully about what had happened, but with Ben's supportive guidance, he was able to relate all that had taken place. The effect of completely bearing his soul was extremely cathartic. All the feelings of anger, jealousy, hurt, betrayal, loss, and self-pity had come flooding out. He suddenly understood that Susan had hit him with her best shot, and he was still standing, bruised and battered, but still standing. He and Ben put together a strategy which included, among other things, hiring a private detective. It was going to be expensive, but he had been putting quite a bit of money aside for some time now. Money Susan didn't know about money for a long romantic vacation for their coming 15th wedding anniversary. He obviously wasn't interested in any romantic trip with Susan now. Next, he went by his in-laws 
and picked up his children. Mary and Bert Roan lived in a modest home in a quiet, tree-lined neighborhood. Mary had recently retired after 30 years of teaching higher math at the local high school. Bert owned a small hardware store. Jonathan had come to love and respect his in-laws almost as much as his own parents. When his father had died over a year earlier, they had both been there for him. He hoped that wasn't going to come to an abrupt end in the near future. His mother-in-law was obviously surprised to see him. John, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at work? queried an obviously perplexed Mary. I've come to realize I have been working too hard during the best years of my life, and that I'm missing my children grow into young adults. From now on that is going to change, he replied. She peered at him intently. She knew something was wrong. First, her daughter Susan had been acting more and more strangely of late. Now her son-in-law, a man who worked as hard as anyone she had ever known, was in her kitchen in the middle of a workday. John, is anything wrong? He gazed directly into her eyes. Did she know anything? Was she an accomplice to Susan in her cheating? She returned his gaze without any sign of duplicity. For now, he would assume she knew nothing. However, he was not ready to fill her in on the details of the last twenty-four hours yet. For now, he would be playing his cards close to his vest. Mary, I can only say I am suddenly aware of how precious this time in my children's life truly is, and I don't want to waste another minute that isn't absolutely necessary. She noticed a mix of pain and loss in his eyes. Suddenly, she had an intuition her daughter had put them there. She gazed lovingly into his eyes, grasped both of his hands in hers, and said, John, if there is anything Bert and I can do for you, don't hesitate to ask. You are like a son to us. Please remember that. Promising that he would take her up on her offer if needed, he gave her a hug, gathered up his children, and drove to his once happy home. Arriving home, he noted his faithful wife's car wasn't there yet. Breathing a sigh of relief at not having to face her just yet, he gathered his children in the living room and told them he and their mom were not getting along right now and that he was going to move into the basement for the time being. He assured them they were the best kids anyone could ask for, and that none of this was their fault. Joey and Nancy ran to their rooms with tears in their eyes. Both had friends who were now living in broken homes. Each felt as though their world was about to fall apart. Cindy sat staring at her hands for a long time. Finally, she looked up into her dad's eyes, and with her voice cracking wailed, it's because of that man I saw doing those things with mom in the living room, isn't it? Then she jumped up and ran into her room. He heard them in their rooms, the otherwise quiet house racked with the sounds of intense sobbing. Things had just become far more complicated. As Susan left Peter's house, the next day her mind was in turmoil. She had been upset when she had arrived the night before and sex had been the last thing on her mind. Hoping that Peter would hold her in his arms and comfort her, she found instead that he was quite worked up. Grabbing her roughly, he had pulled her into a deep kiss while practically mauling her. Pushing Peter away, she had told him with tears streaming down her face that she was too conflicted to be with him that way right then. Unsympathetically, Peter had insisted that sex was just what the doctor ordered to get her mind off her problems. Things had merely gone from bad to worse from that point. They had a rather loud argument, and not feeling she could return home that night, she had slept on Peter's couch. The conflict she was feeling was not new. This past year had been a time of joy and agony, joyed for the selfless love she had given to what she felt to be a broken man, agony over the secrets hidden from her husband of almost fifteen years. Intelligent, rational thought had been her hallmark for as long as she had been old enough to develop good critical thinking skills. Last night, a seed of doubt had been firmly implanted. Awake for most of the night replaying the events of the past year, she had a glimpse of the person she had become. Not fully ready to face that demon, she nonetheless had a sudden urge to pick up her children from her parents' house and then find out how her husband was faring. Arriving at her parents' house, she was shocked when her mother explained that Jonathan had already taken the kids. 
Noting the pensive look on her daughter's face, Mary asked, Susan, what is going on with you and Jonathan? He looked so distraught today, and I have never seen him off on a workday. He's the hardest working man I have ever known. She noted that her mother was almost staring through her with a look that was all too knowing. Unable to keep looking into her eyes, she said, I'll talk to you later, Mom, and left hurriedly. She started driving around without a destination in mind, hoping to get her tumultuous emotions under control. Finally, after an indeterminable amount of time, she drove home. Pulling into the garage and noting her husband's truck, Susan steeled herself and went into the house not knowing what she would face but certain that it would probably be less enjoyable than a root canal. Peter Welch felt as though he were on top of the world. Though he hadn't gotten any last night, he knew there would be lots more in the future. Peter loved seducing married women. He had seduced many into his bed over the years. He loved their experience and their willingness to please. He could often get them to do things that they were unwilling to do for their husbands. He really loved it when that happened. He especially got off on the fact he was cucking their husbands. Though he knew it was dangerous, he loved to cuck them in their own beds. That was the ultimate rush for him. So far, he hadn't been able to get Susan to do it. He felt he had almost succeeded when her oldest daughter had walked in on them. Fortunately, they had only been kissing with their clothes on, but that had put a fast stop to his plans. Susan had been agitated and highly embarrassed, ushering him out the front door immediately and unceremoniously. That is what had inevitably led to her telling her husband of the affair. At first, Peter had been apprehensive about their tryst coming out. However, the more he thought about it, the more he felt he could manipulate events to his ultimate advantage. It could be cucking at its best, leaving her husband a broken man and Susan a willing and guilt-free concubine. Susan had fallen for the same lines he had used for his other conquests. In truth, he really had been sad his wife had died in the accident. He was no longer in love with her, but he didn't want her to die. If she had not flown off the handle after finding out about the other women and started hitting him, he would not have lost control and flipped their SUV. Crazy Witch had almost killed him, too. The insurance money had gone a long way toward healing his sense of loss. Oh yes, it hadn't taken long. Maybe one month after meeting Susan and dejectedly and seemingly reluctantly telling his story, when he saw the tears and compassion in her eyes, he knew it wouldn't be long until he screwed her. Soon he had her doing things she wouldn't do for her husband and telling him how much she loved him. She was one of his favorites, not that she knew about the others. After the incident with her daughter, she told him she had to tell her husband. She said she loved them both and the guilt she was feeling was making their love seem wrong. Hell, he knew it was wrong. That's what made it so good. But he didn't want her to know that, did he? So he had sat her down and convinced her how to tell him. He fed her a bunch of bull about how she could take her husband to the cleaners and make him destitute if he tried to divorce her. He told her how beautiful she was and how her husband would never be able to find anyone as fine as her. Was any of it true? Maybe. Who knows? No one ever knows for sure how a divorce will go. But she believed it. And that's what counts. Now he would get to have her and cuck her husband with his knowledge. Wow. Did he love her? No, but he did love screwing her. Screwing over her husband was also a turn-on. Sooner or later he would dump her. Especially since he'd almost gotten everything he could have wanted from this affair. Still, for a while at least, the best was yet to come. Jonathan heard the garage door open, and with a gush of acid in his stomach, prepared to face his tormentor. As Susan walked into the living room, he wondered who he was confronting, the vile witch from last night, or the loving wife, he as recently as yesterday thought he knew so well. Noting the contrite look on her face, the smeared makeup, and the slumped posture, he thought that at the very least the witch might not be in attendance for the moment. Remembering the last words he had heard from his daughter, he looked at his probably soon-to-be ex-wife and said, Susan, as you so eloquently said last night, we have something we have to talk about.
She looked up somewhat frightened at how sharply he had spoken to her, deciding that tonight he was going to be the one keeping her off guard. He proclaimed, Our daughter is in her room right now bawling her eyes out because of, I quote, the things that man was doing to mom in the living room. What the heck did she see? He growled, fighting to keep his voice under control for the kid's sake. Oh my God, Jonathan, it's not what you think. Cindy came home unexpectedly and saw him kissing me. He had surprised me by coming to the house unexpectedly. You've got to believe I have never had him in the house until that day. I was trying to get him to leave when he grabbed me and kissed me. Just then, Cindy walked in, saw us, and ran to her room. I was horrified. He apologized, saying he had been having a bad day thinking about his dead wife and just wanted some comfort. I told him I was sorry, but he had to leave and never come to the house again. I knew then things were getting out of hand and that I needed to confide in you before you heard about us from someone else and got the wrong idea. Well, wife, how can I believe anything you say right now? You've been lying to me for so long now. Isn't it special that you waited until someone, our daughter, had seen you with him before you decided to come clean? Honey, don't make it sound so sordid and mean. I didn't do it to hurt you. I told you yesterday I did it to help someone who was broken. I wanted you to feel happy for me, for what it meant for me. I thought our love for each other would still be strong. You really disappointed me last night with the hurtful things you said. Jonathan looked at her as if she had just done a table dance at church. I don't even know who you are right now, but if you don't want my lawyer and child protective services making your life a living hell for the foreseeable future, I suggest you shut up and let me speak. You got your say last night. She gulped, sat down opposite him, and for the first time since she had known him felt a small knot of fear. Now, wife, he said with a sarcastic tone, Allow me to sum up what has been going on and how I feel about it. You run around behind my back, cucking me with some jerk for over a year. You tell me you love said jerk, had great sex with him, and will continue seeing him and presumably having sex with him. You get caught doing something that at the very least was inappropriate and at the most vile and illegal in our home, by our daughter. Then, of course... You see the light and decide I should be a part of your precious love story. You ambush me at the end of a long day with this sick tale of betrayal, threaten me with poverty and loneliness, use the children against me, tell me I'm more or less too fat, old, and ugly to attract anyone else, and that even if I did find someone, you would destroy my life. Oh yes, you also reprimanded me for breaking my vows of marriage, for getting upset with you and saying hurtful things. And yet, when did you think about your marriage vows just once? Wife, if I had no new plan to go around giving solace in the form of intimacy to whatever other jerk out there needed it, there would have never been a wedding for you to have received my vows. And don't forget you told me how much you loved me. Thank God you don't hate me. There's no telling what you would have done to me. Does that about sum everything up for you, Susan? She did not look at him could not look at him for long moments. Finally, she looked up with a mixture of fear, antipathy, and oddly a hint of compassion. You make everything sound so sordid. Can't you see I did not do this to hurt you? Can't we get past this and love each other? Can't things be like they were before yesterday? He just stared at her for a long time. Finally, she had to turn her gaze away and stare at her hands again. No, Susan, things will never be the same between us again. You've taken something I cherish with all my heart and broken it irreparably. You still have not said you're sorry about it, and you obviously are going to keep seeing the jerk. I feel more tired right now than I have ever felt in my life. I have moved some of my things into the basement for now. Good night. Susan stared blankly at the spot her husband had just vacated. She could not understand why he was so upset. She knew that his ego might get hurt, but she still couldn't understand why he wasn't more empathetic. Finally, she decided to go to bed herself. She was also feeling as tired as she had ever felt. Though she tossed and turned for some time, she eventually fell into a troubled sleep. 
She heard the moans as soon as she walked through the door. With a sense of foreboding, she moved toward her bedroom. The door was open, and it was easy to make out her husband supine on the bed. It was equally easy to see him with two young, cute little red-headed Flissy in bed. When he was finally done, they embraced and kissed passionately. Finally finding her voice, Susan yelled out, What's going on in here? Who's this witch in my bed? They both looked at her, but their hands kept languidly rubbing and exploring each other. Hi, honey, croaked her husband. This is Brandy. She lost her husband in Arek and has been having a real rough time of it. Just then Brandy turned around. Jonathan, shrieked Susan. You stop at this instant. I can't, Susan. Can't you see how much this means to her and to me? Don't worry, this won't go on forever, but right now it's so right. I thought you would be happy for me. The looks of ecstasy on their faces were more than she could bear. She turned to run and almost fell over her daughter. Cindy, what are you doing here? Don't they look good together? Is she going to be my new mommy? No, she screamed. Suddenly, she was sitting up in bed, wondering who had screamed. Then she realized the scream had come from her. The linens were drenched in sweat, and her heart was beating wildly. Unable to sleep, she lay in bed and tried to think. Slowly, she began to look at what she had done through her husband's eyes. Realization came at a snail's pace. After all, she had been rationalizing her actions for a long time. The old Susan slowly began to emerge. The actions of the past year began to play across the tapestry of her mind. It was almost as if she were watching the actions of a stranger. No, not quite a stranger. Someone somehow familiar, yet not. Almost like a favorite actress. If not an epiphany, it was at least an awakening. As if for the first time she became aware of all she could lose, probably would lose, and she began to think about how she could extricate herself from this disaster of her own making. Finally unable to remain in bed any longer, she took a shower, got dressed, and went downstairs to fix breakfast. As she was puttering around the kitchen, she was surprised when the front door opened and her husband came in dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, breathing hard and dripping sweat. Where have you been, honey, and why are you so out of breath? Don't call me honey, he said with a glare. You gave up the right. I was out for a run. One of the things I've decided is to take more of an interest in my welfare. I have gotten a bit out of shape, and I'm going to change that. I'm sorry. I don't want to fight. Go take your shower and I'll have breakfast ready for you when you're done. He looked at her as if about to say something, and then finally with a shake of his head he headed for the basement. When he came back about a half hour later, he was dressed for work. They ate in silence, both deep in thought, brooding over the turmoil that their lives had now become, and what to do about it. Later, Susan became aware of the garage door opening, and the sound of her husband's truck leaving. She could not remember a time since they were married that he didn't give her a kiss and tell her he loved her before heading off to work. The enormity of what had just happened was more than she could bear. Overcome with tears, she ran to her room, sobbing uncontrollably. Jonathan had decided he needed to go to work today. His family depended on him to bring home the bacon. Besides, he didn't think he could stand a whole day of being around his wife without anything to do right now. Funny how he felt loath to be around someone who just a couple of days earlier he could never get enough of. Thankfully he had gone in to comfort his daughter after she had dropped that bombshell on him the day before. As he held and comforted her, he was able to ascertain that she had come home a little early a few days ago, and when she walked in the door, she had seen her mom being kissed by a man she didn't know. And while, in her opinion, the man's hands were all over her mom, she admitted that her mom had seemed to be pushing him away. They were also both fully dressed— this seemed to confirm what his wife had told him the night before. While he was extremely upset that this had happened in his house in front of his child, he felt safe that his wife would not do something really stupid like screw the jerk in their house where the children could so easily be scared by such a display. Susan had turned out to be a disappointment as a wife, 
but she had always been an excellent mother. They had made the decision early on in their marriage when she had become pregnant to have her quit working and stay home with the children. Susan had actually been a nurse when they had married, and although she had not worked as a nurse in some time, she still kept her nursing license current and read many nursing journals to keep up with advances in health care. Yes, Susan was a born nurturer. Unfortunately, she was nurturing someone she had no business with and in a way that was totally unacceptable to Jonathan. He had intentionally gone into work a little early so that he could talk to his boss, Dale Murphy. He had always gotten along well with Dale. In fact, Dale had often pestered him to become a foreman, but Jonathan had always steadfastly refused, preferring to work with his hands without the stress of management. When he stepped into his boss's office, Dale looked at him with concern. He had never known Jonathan to miss a day of work. Hey John, how are you feeling? I figured you must have come down with a case of the plague or worse to miss a day of work, he half-joked. Dale, I almost wish it was the plague. I think I could have handled that better. Then he told his boss everything he had learned in the past couple of days. When he was done, they were both in a somber mood. John, anything I can do, and I mean anything at all, just ask. I still think you ought to think about that foreman job. It's better money and lots better hours. You are going to need more time for your kids if nothing else. Thanks, boss. Your concern means a lot to me. I'll think about that foreman gig and let you know. I am definitely looking at things from a different perspective now. With that he got to work. It felt good to work with his hands and get his mind off his troubles. Before he knew it, his workday was done and it was time to go home. He was anxious to get home and do something with the kids. He had not realized how much of the pleasure of sharing in his children's lives he had been missing. He hoped that he would be able to amend that and be a part of the rest of their lives. Gradually, Susan calmed down. She got up, took another shower, and put on some makeup. Calling Peter, she was able to persuade him to meet her at his house at one o'clock. He had been curious as to her intentions, knowing from her tone that something was up, but she had not given him a hint. Susan had made up her mind. It was time to end the affair. The costs were already too high, and they just kept mounting. If she were to have any chance at all saving her marriage, she had to cut off all contact with Peter from this point on. Apprehensive at how this meeting would turn out, she still felt it was only right to tell them in person. A phone call would not be right after all the time they had been seeing each other. When she arrived at his house, he was already waiting for her. As soon as she knocked on the door, it swung open. Peter grabbed her in the doorway and started kissing her lips insistently while grabbing hold of her rear end in the process. It was as if he knew what was coming and was trying to re-establish his claim on her. Neither noticed the nondescript car or the man behind the wheel snapping photos at a frenzied pace. Pulling Susan inside and closing the door behind him with his foot, Peter continued his assault. Finally, she was able to push him away. She looked at him with a penetrating stare that was somehow both angry and compassionate. Peter, none of that. We have to talk. Still, he came toward her to grab her again, but she raised one hand up in the universal gesture to stop and grabbed the door handle with her other hand. Peter, if you don't stop, I am leaving right this minute, she cried. Don't make this harder than it already is. Peter backed up, put his hands up, and with a disarming grin said, Okay, I can't help it if seeing you has that effect on me. You're just so darn sexy. Peter, let's go sit down at the dining room table. We have something we have to talk about, she said, not appreciating the irony of her statement. You know I have strong feelings for you. We have had some good times, but I have come to realize that I am a hair's breadth away from totally messing up my marriage and family. I have come to tell you we can't see each other any longer. He looked shocked, and yet there was a hint of something else in his eyes. Anger. Contempt. Arrogance? She wasn't quite sure, but it unnerved her. Finally, he spoke. You can't mean that after all we have shared. I thought we talked about this. Your husband doesn't really have any options. He will get taken to the cleaners if you divorce. 
There was a smugness about him that was making her more uncomfortable by the minute. Peter, she said imploringly, I know what we talked about, but I realized I don't want to lose Jonathan. It may be too late for that already, but if I essentially castrate him by making him a cuckold against his will, I will have lost him for sure. I don't know what I was thinking. He hurt me with some of his comments, but I began to realize just how much I was hurting him. I always told you I loved my husband. Maybe after the things I've done. That is hard to believe. But it is nonetheless true. Come on, Susan. You're just having second thoughts is all, he said, reaching for her hand. That's normal. But how can you end it after all we've meant to each other? She pulled her hand away from him and sat idly twisting her wedding ring around her finger. Looking at him with tears in her eyes, she shook her head. No, we have to stop. It's over. I finally figured out that for the past year, I thought I could have my cake and eat it too. I convinced myself that Jonathan was not missing out on anything. After all, I was home whenever he was. I never denied him anything, and he was not ever supposed to know about you. I told myself that I would only make my marriage stronger because I was feeling so fulfilled. In the end, though, I came to see that I was hurting him. I was rationalizing everything I did, even if it meant throwing some of the blame on him. I was inevitably losing my respect for him. I couldn't help it. After all, I was hiding half of my life from him. I just can't hurt him anymore. He saw that he wasn't going to persuade her with the tact he was taking. Truthfully, he was getting ticked off. How dare she end it with him? He would decide when he was through with her. What kind of game did this witch think she was playing anyway? Deciding to take matters into his own hands, he knew she would be unable to resist him once he started getting physical. He jumped up from his chair and forcibly pulled her into his embrace, pulling her lips to his and using his free hand to pull up her dress and seek out the juncture between her legs she was fighting against and trying to pull away. He used one leg to pry her legs apart. Just as his hand was reaching its desired goal, he felt excruciating pain emanating from his groin. The air rushed out of his lungs as he fell to his dining room floor. Rolling, he thought he might throw up. You creep. I thought you cared for me. How could you do that? What am I, some kind of possession to you? She glared at him with fire in her eyes. We're through. Don't ever come near me or call me again. With that, she spun on her heels and fled through the front door. Once again, she did not notice she was under photographic scrutiny. The week went by quickly for Jonathan. On Thursday, he received a call from the private detective agency, telling him that their report was ready for him to pick up. He made arrangements to meet with them on his lunch hour the next day. That night he had a difficult time sleeping. He knew he had been avoiding decisions he would ultimately have to make. He had been avoiding his wife at home, telling her he was not ready to talk. The tension was so thick, it could have been cut with a chainsaw. His wife had been pleading with him to sit down and talk, and it was getting increasingly harder to avoid. With the P.I. report in his hands, he knew he would have to face up to some difficult choices. The next day upon his arrival, he was ushered immediately into the office of Jason Proud, P.I. Mr. Fremont, can I get you anything? Coffee, tea, or a soda perhaps? Seeing his client shake his head, he went on. Okay, Mr. Fremont, let me just say that I am sorry, but we have some rather bad information to go over with you. Handing Jonathan an envelope, he went on. These are photographs I took of your wife a few days ago, entering and leaving the house of one Peter Welch. Jonathan looked over the stack of photos and visibly flinched as he looked at his wife being kissed and handled by someone else. Going through the entire stack, he also noted her leaving the house with her hair, dress, and makeup rather tussled and a flush about her face. He closed his eyes and just tried to concentrate on breathing for a while. Even though she had told him of the affair herself, seeing the evidence in his own hands made his eyes burn and his emotions blaze. Jason waited patiently for his client to absorb what he had been told. He had been doing this kind of work for years and was used to the emotional minefield caused by the content of many of his reports. 
When he judged that his client looked ready, he began where he had left off. In addition to those photographs, we have come up with quite a sordid past for this Peter Welch. The most interesting aspect of this case is that Mr. Welch's former wife had retained us to follow her husband. She had suspected he was having an affair. Normally, I would not divulge this kind of information, but since Mrs. Welch died only days after we filed our final report, I don't feel it is now client privilege, and it has a definite bearing on the investigation we have done for you. It seems this character is quite the cad. Your wife is only one of many he has managed to seduce. She is not even the only one he is seeing currently. You'll find names and addresses of everyone. We were able to confirm that he is having, or has had an affair with for the past several years. The report is quite thorough, thanks partly to the groundwork from his deceased wife's initial investigation. Please, if we can be of any further assistance, let me know. They shook hands, and Jonathan left the office with his mind in a fog. Finally coming back to the here and now, he made a call to his attorney and told him to start divorce proceedings. It was time to start taking control and moving forward. He was saddened that he felt compelled to divorce someone who had been his best friend, lover, and confidant. Even though he still loved her deeply, he could not see how he could ever trust her again. The marriage they had all these years had been almost a fairy tale. Now it had become a tragedy. He only hoped the future held some promise of hope. That night when he arrived home, his wife was once again sitting at the dining room table with a pensive look on her face. The house was quiet. Obviously, the children were not at home. He steeled himself once again and sat down across the table from his soon-to-be ex-wife. Hello, Susan. Planning to ambush me again? What have you done to hurt me now? She hated seeing the vengeful look on his face. He had never looked at her that way until the past two weeks. What really hurt her is that she knew she was responsible for that new look. Please, Jonathan, she began with as compassionate a look as she could display. I don't want to fight with you. I now know that I am responsible for wounding you probably as deeply as you have ever been. For that I am truly sorry. I know my actions, and particularly my words from that night, make it hard for you to believe it. But I love you more than I could ever love another man. She noticed the disbelieving look in his eyes, but quickly continued. As I said, I know you will find it hard to believe, and I really can't blame you. I now wish that I could go back in time, and none of this could have ever happened. Unfortunately, I can't do that but I will do everything in my power to make up for what I have done. I have ended my affair. I told him I did not want to ever see or talk to him again. Suddenly, Jonathan jumped up and began pacing. Anchor boiled up into his voice. Susan, I don't believe you. He dug into the large brown envelope he had been carrying when he walked into the room and threw some photographs on the table in front of her. It doesn't look like you broke it off with that jerk, Peter Welch, to me wife. Susan looked up sharply at the mention of Peter's name, alarm clearly written across her face. Yes, I know the jerk's name, and a lot more. Doesn't look like you broke it off to me. Looks to me like you could barely get through his door without jumping him. She looked at the pictures before her, saw how incriminating it all looked, and felt faint. It's not what you think. How did you get these? How do you know his name? Well, since you weren't going to tell me, in fact, you told me it was none of my business, I hired someone to find out for me. I used some of the money I was putting aside for our fifteenth wedding anniversary. The anniversary we are never going to have now. She looked as if she had been slapped across the face. No, please don't say that, honey. Please don't say that. I will do anything to stay together. I already have made arrangements to start seeing a counselor. Please, Jonathan, I love you. Please don't say you don't love me. I won't lie to you. I do love you. But I also hate you, hate what you have done and plan to do. On top of that, I have lost my faith and trust in you. I could never stay married to you without that. I have already told my lawyer to file. I'm hoping it can be more amicable than you had planned. I won't lay down and let you run over me. Please, Jonathan, 
I don't know what possessed me to say those things to you. I hope the counselor can help me figure out why, she said between broken sobs. I won't hurt you that way, but can't we somehow make it through this? He gave her a compassionate look for the first time that evening. No, I don't think we can. I think if you truly put yourself in my shoes, you would understand. If I had a year-long affair and then said the things you said to me, you would have tried to castrate me. He pulled a copy of the P.I. report out of the envelope and grabbed hold of her hand. He gave her a loving look and said softly, Susan, I don't know whether to believe you about breaking it off with the jerk, but you need to. He is bad news. I don't want to see you or the children hurt. He handed her the report and left the table for the basement. He still had some matters that needed his attention. The next two weeks were full of ups and downs. A weeping Susan was served divorce papers. However, she continued with her counseling and was hopeful that somehow she could get her husband back. Jonathan joined a gym and was already starting to tone up. In fact, he had already been rather aggressively flirted with by a cute little brunette who looked to be a few years younger than he. He had taken the job as foreman and had moved in with his mother for the time being. He wanted to save money until the divorce was finalized, and he knew where he stood financially. He also wanted a place that was large enough for the kids to come over and stay. Peter Welch had been fired from his job. Jonathan had FedExed copies of the P.I. report to all the husbands whose wives had been seduced by Peter. Seems one of the husbands was a partner at his law firm. Jonathan thought it wasn't very bright for a supposedly intelligent attorney, but apparently he only thought with his desires. Then Peter Welch had apparently been jumped by person or persons unknown coming out of a bar late one night. He was hospitalized with a ruptured testicle, a broken jaw, and all his front teeth were missing. The police investigation was somewhat ambivalent, possibly because one of his paramours had been a cop's wife. Jonathan was questioned, but nothing ever came of it. As soon as he was released from the hospital, Peter left town for parts unknown. Jonathan still had mixed feelings about the divorce. He began going to meetings with her and her counselor. He's not sure exactly what his future will look like, but it doesn't look as though he will be penniless and alone. By taking control of his life, he had managed to protect his dignity and his peace of mind. He no longer wore his wedding band, but he had not thrown it away yet. He kept it in a bag in the top drawer of his dresser, the only other occupants of the bag being four adult teeth. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, Please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.